Welcome everyone to our homework four walkthrough. In this assignment, we are gonna be covering selection, non-comparison sorts, and data structures. So let's get us started. In problem one, we are going to be reviewing the select algorithm that we covered in class in lecture eight. So I encourage you to pause the video and take a look at lecture eight. In particular, you wanna take a look at the proof of the select algorithm working correctly, which allowed us to derive the proper running time. In lecture, we actually covered that the running time of the algorithm is essentially T of, or the, the recursive relation that we can use to solve the running time is T of N is equal to T of N divided by five. Now the T of N divided by five is coming from the fact that in order to choose a good pivot, um, not using the randomized version. We actually calculate the medians of each of the subgroups that we create. In the original version of the algorithm, we create groups of size at most five each, which means that there are essentially n over five medians um, or the ceiling of n over five medians. But for all intents and purposes, we do not care about the ceiling here. It's just gonna be an off by one or off by two issue, which just does not matter for our runtime analysis. So um, as I mentioned, we call ourselves recursively on this smaller array of just the medians in order to get the median of the medians, essentially. So that's where our t um, with an input of n divided by five is coming from. Then we partition ourselves into the left side and the right side after we have you know, selected the pivot, which is the median of medians. That's gonna take us O of n time. And that's always the case. It takes O of n time to partition the left and the right. And then finally, we're gonna call ourselves recursively on either the left or the right, again, depending on what our pivot was. And really what we did here is we tried to figure out what is the largest possible size of either the left or the right side of the arrays. And essentially the argument that we used is that for the median of medians, uh, let me pull it up here. If we go over to lectures and we go to lecture eight, it'll actually be helpful for you guys because you will be able to see that in fact, if we scroll down uh, to the proof by picture, um, we essentially argued that, you know, this is a good example. When we pick the seven, which is our median of medians, it is in fact, um, bigger than at least half of the groups and three elements from each of those groups. So here, um, our groups are of size five. So there are three elements that we are for sure bigger than because we're bigger than their medians. So we can say that it's n divided by five, that's the number of groups for about half of them. There are three elements within each of those groups that we are bigger, so this gives us a total size that we are bigger than 30% of all the elements in the array, three n over 10. So our median is for sure bigger than at least 30% of the array. Now that means that in this case, our right side, which is all the elements that are bigger than our median could be at most seven n over 10. Um, so this is just n minus three n over 10. It's a seven n over 10. You can imagine we make the exact same, same argument for the, uh, for the left side. So, you know, very similar argument leads us to the exact same numbers. And we always pick the larger number because we're trying to find sort of that upper bound on the running time. So that's actually where our T7n over 10 comes from um, in our recurrence relation that we covered in class. So again, this is for the basic algorithm. So in problem 1.1, what we're gonna do is we're actually going to create groups that are of size at most seven. So here we're going from five to seven. That's the difference, that's it. And the only thing that we're asking for in this problem is for you to give the recurrence relation for this modified algorithm and also give us the running time of this modified algorithm. So again, jumping to the recurrence relation, we can immediately see that our first uh, element in the recurrence relation is actually gonna be different because now we have groups of size seven, which means we actually have n over seven medians. We don't have n over five medians, we actually have less medians because each group is bigger. 
So we have m groups total, let's say, and because each group has seven elements, there are n over seven groups, which means there are n over seven medians, and then we call ourselves recursively to compute the median of the medians, right? So that's where we get the tn over seven. Then we partition into the left and the right. This is gonna stay the same. It still takes O of n time. So the last piece that we need to look at here is essentially can we make a similar argument to what we did when we had groups of size five to argue that a particular number of elements are definitely smaller than our median. So again, let's pretend we picked you know, seven as the median here. We know that there are n over seven groups. And again, by a similar argument, around half of them, you know, at, at, at least half of them are small, have smaller medians than us, because we were the median. And within each of those groups, four of the elements are actually going to be smaller um, than us, right? So this actually gives us 2n over seven elements. So around two sevenths of the entire array is definitely smaller than our median of medians that we selected, which means that the right side of our partition is going to be at most n minus 2n over 7, which is essentially 5n over 7. And that gives us the second part of our recurrence here, which instead of 7n over 10, it becomes 5n over 7. Now, I do give you guys a hint. This recurrence is not one where you can directly apply the master theorem. However, I do say that you can assume that the function is what we call submodular. So uh, this is not always the case, and I'm actually writing the wrong thing. Let me fix this. So t of x plus t of y, it is not always the case that t of x plus t of y is less than t of x plus y. You can imagine there are many functions where that's not the case. This is something known as submodularity. We're not going to cover that here, but I do give you the hint that you can assume that is true for this specific problem, which means you can simplify the recurrence relation just a little bit or upper bounded by O of n plus n over 7 plus 5n over 7, which gives you 6n over 7. Now, this recurrence relation, you can apply the master theorem directly which means we just want to compute the values of A, the values of a B, and the values of D. So obviously we have D equal to one because it's n to the first work. We have D equal to seven over six. Uh, hopefully this is clear to you since we are dividing by seven over six each time, even though I wrote it as six n times seven. Um, you can very easily rewrite that as you know n divided by seven sixths. So our b is 7, 6, and our a is 1. Now, uh, by the master theorem, that means that a is actually uh, smaller than b to the d, which means our running time is dominated by the work at the top of the tree rather than the leaves. Um, so the running time in total is O of n. This is a very skinny tree, is what we would say. And that's essentially what we're looking for in part 1.2. Now, moving on to part one. Point three. in just a second, we are actually going to ask for smaller and smaller chunks. So what we're trying to do here is essentially determine what is the recurrence relation when instead of groups of size five, we are going to be using groups of size three. Now this question might seem familiar to you because it was asked on your quiz, but in this part, I really wanna make sure everybody understands why groups of size five matter, okay? So if we do groups of size three in order to compute the median, right, to compute the median of the medians, that is gonna be a recursive call on an array of input size uh, n over three, then we partition into the left and the right, so that stays the same. And then we do our final step, which is we need to argue that some number of elements is a smaller. So again, looking at the proof, we can follow very similar logic where we say, well, around half of our n divided by three groups are going to be on the smaller side of our median. And for each of those groups, there's actually gonna be exactly two elements that are smaller. So multiplying this out, that actually gives us that a third of our elements are definitely smaller. Now, what that means is that two thirds of our element, that at most two thirds of our elements are bigger. So the right side of our array can be at most two thirds of the original array. So plugging that into our recurrence relation, we actually get 
plus um, t divide, uh, of 2n divided by 3 as an upper bound. Now, again, you cannot directly apply master theorem to this, but by the hint that I gave you, you can imagine putting this together into tn plus n, so n divided by 3 plus 2n divided by 3 is n. However, we know for a fact that we always call ourselves an array that is at least one smaller, so this is a very loose upper bound. We can tighten it up a little bit by doing t of n minus 1. And again, you can, can't directly apply the master theorem here, but you should be able to unroll the recurrence to get a sense of what the actual answer would look like. So you can unroll it as O of n plus T of n minus 1. I'm just rewriting what we wrote in line 10. And then unrolling one more time, so again expanding what T of n minus 1 is equal to, we get O of n plus T plus O of n minus 1 plus T of n minus 2. And hopefully at this point you are seeing the pattern where we can simply continue uh, unrolling this until we do O of n minus 2 dot 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 O of 2 O of 1. Um, and this essentially becomes a summation where it's n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 plus 2 plus n minus 3 plus n minus 4 dot 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 you know plus 2 plus 1 um, which essentially sums up to n squared so the running time of this algorithm is actually o of n squared which means if you partition two small groups uh, and the groups are too small then you will actually get a running time that's o of n squared instead of our original o of n Now we uh, move on to the next problem. So for this problem, I encourage you guys to take a look at lecture 12 where we cover self-balancing binary search trees. And really what we're gonna need here is just the rules for a red-black tree. So there are certain properties that a red-black tree must satisfy in order to be a valid red-black tree. I'm gonna cover each of these in detail, but essentially the root of a red-black tree must be black. Uh, of course, every node must be colored either red or black. That's where the name comes from. The root node must be black. Um, the nil children count as black nodes, so nil children are considered black nodes. Uh, children of a red node are black nodes, must be black nodes. You can never have a red node that has a child that is another red node. And then finally, the last one is the most important one which is that for every single node x, all paths from that node to the nils must have the same number of black nodes on them. Essentially, what we're saying is that if we were to remove every red node from the tree, or if we were not remove them, but if we ignore every red node in the tree, then the tree is per perfectly balanced. So the black nodes are perfectly balanced. Uh, and obviously by the third rule that we covered, the red nodes are not too unbalanced because again, you can't ever have a tree that's just a bunch of red nodes. You must have, every red node must have a black node as a child. Um, so looking at problem one, we can imagine, you know, the first thing we do is the root must be black. That's by, by default. And then really the most important thing is that every path from the root to a null child must have the same number of black nodes. Um, the trick here is to really consider, you know, if we look at the right right path, so going from the root to the right right, and then or, and also we look at going from the root left, 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 we notice that we have three nodes on the right right path, and we have five nodes on the left left path. So on the right right path, the best we can hope for is for both of those nodes to be black because both of these paths must have the same number of black nodes. So you can imagine that on the shorter path, you want to have as many black nodes as possible. So that gives you flexibility on the longer path because you're going to need to be able, you, you want to have at least two, um, or in this case, at least three black nodes, right? If we had only two black nodes on the right path, you can imagine that the left path will not, will, we won't be able to have just two black nodes. So we want them to have the same number of black nodes. And the reason is because if we don't have a black node, the node must be red. But once we insert a red node, the next node must be black. So the best we can do here is that the red root left is red, which forces the root left left to be black uh, by the rules of the um, 
by the rules of what it means to be a red black tree and then the best we can hope for is we can make the next one red um, which you know means we don't use up one of our reds because we need them to be two, there need to be three at most uh, including the root um, which then leaf says the last one must be black however um, which actually works out in our in our favor here so I encourage you guys to pause the video and think through that uh, the rest of the work here would be to fill up the rest of the tree to make sure that every single path from any node to the null leaves to the null nodes at the very end of the leaves have the exact same number of black nodes without violating any of the other rules. Let's move on to the next section in 2.2. You'll notice here that the thing you want to pay attention to is that the tree that is shown is actually very similar to the tree we just discussed. The biggest difference is we now we don't have this right, right, right uh, path, which really means, again, uh, the key thing to keep in mind here is that every path from any node to a null value must have the same number of black nodes. So as you can see, you know, in this case, because we removed that rightmost child, um, we actually only have at most two black nodes here. Um, this must be, uh, you know, you're going right, right, and both of them, at, in, you know, in the best case scenario, they're both black. Um, but another thing to keep in mind is that when you go right and then left, uh, that child there must be, this one must be red. It cannot be black because if it's black, then you would have a path from the root to a null child, which has three black nodes. And then you would have a path from the root to a null child, which has two black nodes. So at most, we must have two black nodes here. And you can imagine, um, you know, you can think through this, but you can see that maybe it'll be a problem if we go left, 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 left. Um, again, keep in mind the rules. So on the next part, we're actually going to look at radix sort. We're going to cover, you know, as we talked in class, the running time for radix sort is actually um, big O of D times N plus R. And just to summarize what we covered in class, is that really uh, radix sort is nothing more than a small for loop where for each digit you call counting sort by that digit in your input. So that's where the D comes from because the D is actually the number of uh, digits in your input. And something that we want to just make sure we keep in mind is that when we had an input, for example, like 1, 23, 1, 2, 3, we actually zero padded these values um, so that they all had three digits and that's how we were able to generalize the algorithm to work with them. So D is actually the number of digits in the largest element that we are trying to sort. Um, now, as I mentioned, that's the outer for loop and then the inner for within each iteration of the for loop we call counting sort. And counting sort really takes running time of N plus R. Why is that? That's because we iterate over each element and there are n of elements. So that's gotta be at least O of n if we do constant work, which we do constant work within each iteration. And then we also need to iterate over all of the buckets again. So our buckets are R and they correspond um, to essentially the number of buckets that we create, right? So R is the number of buckets. It is also the base that we're using. So in the example that we used in class, we used the base 10, so our buckets were 10, but we also used base 100, for example, so our buckets were actually 100. And in this homework assignment, we're actually gonna use a completely different base. So let's jump on that. We're gonna look at radix sort on characters. So here we're actually given a fixed w so w is going to be our input vector of strings that we're trying to sort as the problem states um, the goal is to so sort them lexicographically so lexicographically just means we're sorting them alphabetically there's nothing tricky about that the only thing that we do need to cover is that the space character uh, actually comes before a lexicographically so if you were to sort you know a space it would actually show up before the letter A. 
um, or the word a. So that's just one thing to keep in mind because in this case, we're actually gonna be using spaces in order to pad our words. And what we're looking for in this assignment is we're looking for descriptions of D, N, and R for this particular problem. Um, again, these are not gonna be related to digits because we're now looking at strings. So I'll give you, you know, pause the video and kind of think about um, what might be that we use, for example, characters. Um, instead of uh, instead of digits. So if we look at the characters instead of the digits, then the meaning, um, you know, you could think through why that would work if we were actually to use radix sort looking at characters, but also the meaning of the variable d changes. It is now the maximum number of characters in any of our words. It is no longer the maximum number of digits in any of our input. Um, and again, this also depends on the base that you're picking. So automatically here, we're assuming that the base is a character base to base. So W is actually of length nine. And another thing to consider is that in our case, D is actually five because the longest word is, you know, for example, quick, which has five elements, brown, which has five elements. I believe jump as well has five elements. And you can imagine that the rest of the words are actually gonna be space padded space pattern at the end so that they end up being sorted correctly uh, according to radix sort because again radix sort has to start at the very uh, very uh, very uh, very uh, uh, it starts at the very end of the word that's how it starts sorting so n in our case is actually nine uh, there are nine elements in the in the list that we're trying to sort and our base, as we discussed, is actually a little bit trickier. It turns out that we have every single letter in the alphabet in this example. So there's actually 26 letters in the alphabet. So that should be 26 lowercase letters. Um, and then we also need to create space, you know, one bucket for the space character. So in total, we're going to have 27. R is gonna be 27. That's the number of buckets that we're gonna have. So we can imagine that we're working in base 27, basically. Um, Again, but this has nothing to do with numbers or digits. That's just what we would call it. So moving on to 3.2. In this part, we're actually gonna be covering the ASCII representation. So basically what we're saying is that instead of sorting the words directly using the characters, what we're gonna do first is we're gonna convert the words into their corresponding ASCII representation. You can actually look up what the ASCII representations are. So as shown here, you can see that the letter A actually has an eight digit binary representation, which corresponds to the number 97. That's what it means for the ASCII representation. And then that's actually what we're gonna do first here. So for example, we'll have the word D with two space characters at the end. What we're gonna do is we're gonna convert the letter T to its ASCII representation, which is given by this number. Then we're gonna convert the letter H to its ASCII representation, which is given by these eight digits. And then we're gonna convert E as well to its ASCII representation, which is given by these eight digits. So you can imagine doing that for every single word. And we're gonna consider using radix sort on the strings um, that we end up getting out of this. So every string is gonna be a sequence of zeros and ones. Uh, the last thing to keep in mind is that space, uh, that all of the letters in ASCII are already sorted in order by binary. And the space character which is actually given by this code, comes um, far, far before uh, the A character. So there's nothing you need to worry about in terms of like, you know, is converting to ASCII gonna mess up uh, the ordering of my sort because they are already um, sorted using the proper uh, setup with the most significant digits towards the left of the value, um, which is the same thing as when you sort by uh, alphabetically. Um, so it'll just work out in this case. So you can imagine that to complete out the D, we would actually add two space characters just like this, and we'll get a 40 bit string. Uh, so 40 bits, we mean that there's 40 characters here actually. And there's a, there's exactly a total of 40 of them. Um, and you can imagine that for our example, 40 is going to be the maximum number of characters that we are. Have again, this question is going to be asking you for the values and descriptions of D, N, and R. Uh, again, using the W that was given in 3.1. So D, 
n and r. So we can see that d is really the number of digits after we've done this conversion, which as we discussed above, for each character we have 8-bit strings, which means there's a total of 40 digits, because the longest word has 5 characters, and each character is 8 digits long, which means there are 40 bits. Um, so every word is going to become 40. N is still 9 because we have exactly 9 words. And on R, which is our base now, really consists of only the characters 0 and 1, which means R is going to be 2. Uh, the length, you know, the number of buckets that we have to create is precisely 2. Hopefully that's clear to you, but I encourage you to think about that. Pause the video if you want to try 3.3 on your own. Anyway, moving on to 3.3, we will be no longer using the words that were given above, but instead we're presented with this challenge um, where now we want to sort by dates in addition to sorting alphabetically. So what exactly do we mean by this? We mean that, for example, the word jumps, which was actually uh, published in November 19th, 1562 for the first time, we want this word to be sorted by its published date first, and then within each published day, um, then we want to sort the words that are remaining alphabetically, right? So our goal is to first have the string sorted by date, and then alphabetically within that date. So to walk through an example of that, we can take a look at jumps, hello, and let's say that we have another word, let's say Jesus, that was published on November 18th, 1562. So let's say jumps and hello were both published on the same day. So what the sorting that we would be looking for is we want Jesus to be first because it was published earlier. So it doesn't matter whether it comes after or before jumps or hello, it always goes first because it was published earlier. Then we have hello and jumps because though those two were published in the same day, that means we want to sort them in the same day. Now, another example, consider that hello had actually been published on the same day as Jesus, then we would actually want hello and Jesus to be sorted and come before jumps. And that's just because it doesn't matter that jumps is alphabetically after, it's just jumps published after hello and Jesus. So that's the goal, and uh, really hopefully, I, I hope that clarifies the question for you. But essentially, all we're looking for is what should we use instead of jumps in order for this sort, uh, for radix sort, to give us the right ordering of our words. Um, you know, we're probably going to need to either prepend, append, or or do something where we we have to include the date information in our string. Um, but we want to be careful about where we include it so that when we sort it, it is sorted correctly uh, using the definition that was given in the problem statement. As a hint, you can write dates using numbers. You can include, uh, you know, you can include the dashes. You can also write dates in a different way where you can write the year first and then the month and then the day. Um, that might be helpful. So you definitely want to consider what is the string that jumps would become. Um, you can also space pad it either before or after. So there's a lot of possibilities here and all we're looking for is what string would you use for the word jumps in order for it to sort correctly. <clears throat> the next question moving on is 3.4. I encourage you to pause the video to think through this for a little bit. If you're back, then really what we're looking for is a completely new problem statement where we now have a list V of words that are commonly used in the English language. And what we're going to do, as the statement says, we are going to number the list of words using binary, where the first word is given the number 0, the second word is given the number 1, and the third word is given the number 1, 0, which corresponds to 2 in binary. And the fourth word intuitively would be given the number one one which corresponds to three in, in binary now um, this is the dictionary or all the words that we will ever encounter um, so we are going to be given the list a w or some list let's say for example the test high uh, is the list that we're given to sort and our v is actually the test high and we're giving the list the test high v to sort 
So what this is going to mean is that v is going to become 0. We're going to map it to 0. Test, we're going to map it to 0, 1. So it's just in whatever order we encounter it. <clears throat> and hi, we're going to map to 1, 0. Um, so that's, this is essentially the conversion where we say we, we count the word, we give it a number, but we write that number in binary. And essentially, instead of sorting the array v test high v, we're going to sort the array 0, 1, 10, uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. Um, that's the conversion that we're looking for here. And what we want is we're going to sort that using radix sort, and I want you to give me the running time of radix sort uh, using this approach, where we're sorting, uh, again, character by character, but we're sorting in a binary. Um, so really what we, the pieces of information we know is that V has N words in it. So the size of V is N. And really we know that the running time of radix sort is D times N plus R. So our goal here is really to figure out what are each of those values. What is D, what is N, what is R, if we do know them, right? So I encourage you to pause first the video for a second and give it a shot yourself. If you're back, then we can immediately see that R is actually a constant. You know, given the conversion that we're doing, we're only going to have two buckets, zero and a one. Uh, because our strings or our numbers, if you want to consider the numbers, are all in binary and they're all going to be zeros and ones. N is going to be the size of a V, uh, which is just how big our world is, right? That is N. That's the size of our world. Um, so definitely think through this. Um, the, the real problem now is figuring out what D is. What is the value of D? Indeed, what is the value of a D? So D is actually going to be log of base 2 of N. Uh, you can see here. Hopefully this makes sense to you. It's actually the ceiling of this plus 1. But essentially, if we take the last uh, word in, in the V, it is going to be assigned the number N. And we're going to have to write it in binary, which means it's going to take us log base 2 of N plus 1 digits. Um, <clears throat> we can actually see this immediately. We can write an example, uh, right? Uh, as we said, V test high map to 0, 1, and then 1, 0 for high, which is two digits long. If we make this V be of size, let's say, 5, uh, for example, let's add car and chase, then, you know, car is going to become 100, zero zero, and uh, chase is going to become 101, as we, as we write it here. Or, or sorry, 0110, one zero, a car is going to be 11, one one, and chase is going to be 100, zero zero, which is actually three digits, which is log base 205, which is around um, 2. Uh, plus one, which gives you three. Um, and actually here what I wrote, ceiling, that is incorrect. It should be the floor function that we are looking at. But really it's off by one at most, so we don't worry too much about this here. Anyway, now we have all the variables that we need, so we can actually see that the running time is log n, log n. So in order to sort the list using this conversion, it is going to take n log n running time. Hope that's clear and that makes sense. Now moving on to the next part, we're going to be looking at a one hot encoding. So again, a one hot encoding is an encoding where we're going to have n spaces. So for each word, it is going each word is going to map to a string consisting of all zeros except for one single one. Uh, there's going to be n characters total, n bits total, and essentially each word in our space of V is going to be given the um, going to be assigned a string of length n as its representation. So for example, car uh, test becomes 0001, car becomes 0010, computer becomes 0100, mice becomes 01000, uh, and so on and so forth as I am writing in the video right now.
that is what it means to do a one-hot encoding. These encodings are actually quite popular in machine learning. So now you've been introduced to what a one-hot encoding means. If you ever see that, mean, that uh, terminology in any of your machine learning classes, you can thank this course for having introduced you to it. Now, uh, we can see immediately that um, the length uh, of our space V is n, and that also corresponds to the number of digits that we have. Um, So again, going back uh, to try to figure out the running time of this solution, we need to figure out what D, N, and R are. Uh, you know, I encourage you to take a second to pause the video and figure this out on your own. If you're back, then it should be obvious that R is two and D stays the same and that D, the number of digits is actually equal to N as we discussed, which gives us a running time of N times n plus 1, which is essentially O of n squared. So using a one-hot encoding, read x sort actually takes O of n squared time. Moving on to the final written problem, this is majority voting in a private setting. Really, this is a very, very interesting problem, so I encourage you to pause the video and try it on your own and see how far you get. But essentially what we're given is we're given one function called ballots match that returns either true or false if the ballots match or not. By match, that means that the ballots have voted for the same candidate in the race and the ele election that we're looking at. Now, um, it is you can do nothing else with these ballots except see if they match. There's nothing else you can do with them. You cannot hash them, you cannot look inside the ballot, and you cannot tell. Now, the, the problem here is we're actually asking you to give a deterministic divide and conquer algorithm that uses n log n calls to ballots match um, and returns the winning candidate. So that's what we're looking for, and that's what we want to do. So again, we do tell you it's a divide and conquer algorithm. We do tell you it's n log n. That should remind you of hopefully merge sort. So pause the video here and really give this an honest go to see if you can think of what the solution might look like. Now coming back, really if we're, you know, if you're back, if you give it an honest go and you're coming back to the video, uh, what I encourage you to do is to think of a divide and conquer approach. So the first thing we want to do is what is the natural way to split the problem? What is the most natural subproblem that we could think of? So a way to think about this is we can start writing the pseudocode. Our algorithm is called winner and it's given us input in array A of ballots. And what it's going to do is it's going to return a single ballot that course that occurs n over two, at least n over two times. So again, we are given in the problem statement that it is guaranteed that the winning candidate uh, had the majority votes so the number of votes that the winning candidate had were more than n over two so again i encourage you to pause the video and think about this but this is what your algorithm might look like okay if you're back then a natural way to split this really is to split the array in half so let's say we take the first half and the second half of the array we call those right and left. Um, intuitively, the question we would want to ask ourselves here is, uh, well, you know, it's a good opportunity to add a base case, actually. So if the length of the array is equal to 1, then we immediately know who the winning candidate is. In fact, he is the only candidate. So we can return the single ballot that... Um, was given if the array is of size one. So we can take care of our base case. Again, this is because we're gonna be using a divide and conquer algorithm. So we are gonna be calling ourselves recursively on the left and the right. So why is splitting the array a natural subproblem? So once you split the array in halves, you really wanna think about the second question, which is assume that you have an answer to each of the subproblems you're considering. So again, don't worry about the fact you haven't solved the problem yet. The point of divide and conquer is to first consider some natural subproblems and then pretend that you have the answer to those subproblems. 
Okay, so that's what we're gonna write here in the pseudocode. We're gonna pretend that we call ourselves recursively on the smaller halves of the array uh, on the left and the right side. And what we're gonna be given is we're gonna be given the left winner and the right winner. So now we know the answer to the left side of the array, to the left half of the array, and we know the answer to the right half of the array, right? I encourage you to pause the video now and sort of think through how would knowing the answers to each of these halves help you figure out who's the winner overall, right? So we know the winner if we only look at the first half of the ballots, and we know the winner if we only look at the second half of the ballots. What does it, um, yeah, how, how can we combine this? You know, we know all right, so hopefully you're back. One way to think about this is that we know that for our input array A, one of the balance occurs more than half of the time, right? More than n over two times. So we know this for a fact. This is given to us in the problem statement. Now, what you want to convince yourself of is of the following fact. Hopefully this makes sense to you, but, or this is something that you came to already. But if the ballot occurs more than half of the time in the whole array, then when I split the array into two equal sized pieces or about equal size, the ballot must appear more than a fourth of the time overall. So more than N over four times, which is more than half of the time in each in at least one of the halves. Um, that's something that you really want to think through and convince yourself of it being true, okay? When I split it into two equal sized pieces, because I know that one of the ballots occurs more than half of the time, then the winner must appear more than half of the time in one of the two subarrays, and at least one of the two subarrays. Again, we can think of this as an example. So let's say we have an input that is of size, let's say eight. Um, we know for a fact that one of the elements occurs more than half of the time. So it must occur five, at least five times. So for example, we have one, 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 six, seven, eight. Um, essentially what I'm saying is that no matter how I split this array into halves, um, so again, basically it's saying it doesn't matter the order of my original array. When I split it into halves, the left and the right, one of the halves will have the winner. There is no question about that. Um, why is that? It's because each half must have four numbers and there are five ones, which means one of the halves you know, in one scenario, we could have one, 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 and one, six, seven, eight, which means the left half actually had the one be the majority element in that half of the array. That's kind of like the best case scenario. But even in the worst case scenario, you should convince yourself that no matter how we split the ones, because there are five of them, we must have at least one of left or right must have three of the ones, even in the worst case scenario. Um, so this is another example now where the left, where the right array is the one that has the majority element as the one, which is the winner. So this is one example, but really what we're trying to get at is that because the winner occurs more than half of the time in the array, then um, no matter what we do here when we call ourselves on the left or the right, one of these must be the winner for the entire array. That is the case. If the, uh, the one that is not the winner does not actually matter to us, but given that the array has a majority element, then one of these must be the winner. Therefore, what we can do is we can just see, um, you know, the easiest case to see is if the ballots are the same, then the majority winner is just the winner. Um, because if both if the, if the winner on the left and the right are the same people, then they actually won the entire election. Now, if they're different, it's actually not that much harder. What we can do is we can actually just count how many times each of them won, and we can simply return um, the winner that won more than n over two times. Because if such a winner exists, then he must also win n over two times in either the left or the right, 
which means that he must be one of the left or the right winners. So what we can do is we can write a for loop that simply counts how many times does the left winner occur in the array and how many times does the right winner occur in the array. That's exactly what we're doing now. We're writing the pseudocode to just count this. And then something to notice is that counting this really will only take at most O of N calls to ballots match. Um, we'll cover the running time in a little bit, but by the master theorem, you should have in your mind an idea that as long as I don't do too much work uh, to bring my answers back together, I should be able to achieve an N log N or better running time. Uh, but then basically here what we do is we have counted the balance, and now that we've counted the balance, we just check to see if the left winner, if the left occurred more than n over two times, then he is the winner of the election. Otherwise, we return the other winner. And again, it doesn't really matter um, as long as our algorithm returns the right answer when the right answer exists, then we will return the right answer every time. Now there is a situation where if we're given an array where there is no strict majority, then obviously this will not return the right answer um, because that is not designed to do so. However, for the running time, we can see that we call ourselves twice on an input that's about the half, half of the original input. So that's where we get the two times n divided by two. And then we do about O of n calls to ballots match in our for loop. So we have an O of n extra work. Uh, that we're doing at each level in addition to our recursive calls. Now, by the master theorem, we can actually see that A is equal to 2, B is equal to 2, and D is equal to 1, which means that A is actually equal to B to the D, uh, aka 2 is equal to 2 to the first, which means that the running time for this algorithm, or the number of times it calls ballots match, is precisely O of N log N as desired in our assignment. Hopefully that makes sense to you. This is a very, very fun problem. There is also a bonus problem that asks you to figure out whether there's a faster algorithm. And I'll tell you the answer is yes, there is. But you will not receive any extra points for figuring this out, but I encourage you to give it a try. It's actually quite interesting. And one quick hint that I can give you is that if it's the algorithm is actually O of N, it is linear time. And in fact, it takes advantage of the fact that the winner occurs exact, um, at least n over two times. And it's not super complicated, to be honest with you. It's a little tricky to know how it works and why it's always right. But um, since it's linear, you can imagine that it can't be that complicated. It is not a divide and conquer algorithm. It is a simple for loop algorithm. Okay, so that's it. Thank you uh, for the written part, at least. Uh, for the last section, you want to come by and fill out the form if you could. That would help me out a lot. That is worth 10 points of your assignment. So please fill it out and give me feedback as to how you felt about this homework assignment. Now, moving on to the coding section. Uh, this is the last section of the assignment. You should be able to open up the homework for code. And we're actually going to go to homework four here. And we're going to take a look at the readme. You're actually given two problem statements, so we're going to look at them in order. So the first problem actually asks you to merge many sorted lists. Again, this is a little bit of practice for you guys. And actually, in this walkthrough, I am not going to walk through the optimal implementation. I'm actually going to walk through the more naive implementation, um, which I actually give you an English description of this implementation. Now, this implementation, if you do choose to go this route, will have a running time of n times m times m, where n is the number of lists that you have, and m, sorry, where n is the length of each list, and m is how many lists you have. Um, you will lose points with this implementation. The auto grader will fail in the timeout portion, so you will lose four points if you go with this implementation. However, I think it is not hard to see how to modify this implementation to actually make it faster. So for the purposes of this walkthrough, I am going to go through and walk through the implementation of the quote-unquote naive solution to this problem. 
So let me go ahead and change my syntax to C++ so that we can all color code it. Now we are going to be taking as input a vector of vectors of integers, which are going to correspond to each of our sorted lists. That is the input that is given to us. And our goal is to return a single vector of integers that has merged all the lists and that is sorted. Right? So the return value that we return should be, must be, will be sorted. Now, the very first thing that we want to do uh, in this case, as per the English description, is we want to create an indexes vector that is going to hold essentially values that tell us what index we're in in each of our vectors that we're merging. So indexes i, uh, correction, uh, let me fix this, indexes i tells me where I am in, sorted in the ith sorted vector. So indexes i is going to be an integer from 0 to the size of the ith vector in sorted vex. And it's going to tell me what is the value I am looking at in that sorted vector. Right? Does that make sense? So indexes i is actually going to start out as all zeros, which means I am trying to look at the first element in every sorted vector. And what we're going to do is we're going to do this iteratively where we will try to find the minimum element that we're currently, out of all the ones we're looking at, and we will put that into our output. So this is why at first I'm going to start out with a while true loop. So this is an infinite loop uh, for now, but we're going to see that it will actually end um, based on some of the checks that we're going to include inside. So the very first thing we want to do is we want to iterate over our indices to find the smallest valid index. Essentially the first index that we have, the first index pointing to a valid entry in the vector. So what do we mean by valid? It means that we haven't run out of elements. You can imagine as you iterate over the while loop, you might, you know, if all the elements in the first vector are the smallest, you might actually run out of those elements. So you don't want to keep looking at that vector. So the easiest way to do this is just to check to see if the index at the ith location is smaller than the size of the vector at the ith location. If it is smaller than the size of the vector at the ith location, then this is a perfectly valid index. So we immediately set that as our uh, first valid index, as we're about to do here in writing, and we break out um, of our for loop. So again, indexes i is going to be compared to sorted vectors i dot size. And if it is smaller, then we will do something. As we were saying, um, we compute the first valid index here and we set that equal to i. So our first valid index at the very beginning of the while loop, we're gonna set it equal to negative one, let's say. And then what we can do after this for loop has finished executing is we can check to see if our first valid index is less than zero. If it is less than zero, then that means that we didn't find any valid indices in this iteration of our algorithm. So we immediately break um, because that means we're done. We have finished. There were no valid elements we were looking at in the sorted vectors. Once we have a, a first valid index, then our job is actually to find the minimum uh, out of all the vectors that we have contained within our sorted vectors. So again, what we do there is we could actually start i at the first valid index, but it really doesn't matter because what we're going to do is we're actually going to include the check um, to avoid uh, looking at the first valid index within our if statement. But you can see here we can start with first valid index plus one or something else. Um, so what does this check look like? So essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at the <coughs> ith element at the ith vector and we're trying to look into the index that we're pointing at. So we do indexes i to get the thing that we should, the index of the element that we should look at in the ith vector, all right? Um, and we compare that to our, let's say, first valid index, but let's say, you know, let's keep track of the current minimum. So let's call it current min you know, that starts as the first valid index. Um, so we compare it to the current min to see if the value that we're seeing is actually smaller than the current min out of all the other vectors that we've seen so far. So we can just do this here. We do current min. 
Um, and it's getting a little long, so I'm gonna see if I can maybe, uh, I think this should maybe be valid C++. Anyway, that's just so you guys can see it, where we're looking at sorted vex at the ith, we're looking at the ith vector at the, in the ith pointer that we want to, and we're comparing that to the current minimum. If it's smaller, then the current minimum gets updated to be the ith, ith uh, vector, because that's what we're, we're pointing at. Um, once this for loop is done iterating, then obviously we will have found the strict, the first strict minimum out of all the elements that we were looking at. Hopefully that's clear. Uh, something to keep in mind though, however, is that you'll notice that we do do indexes i, which means we do want to check that we use indexes i, the result of that, as an index into sorted vectors i which means we wanna make sure that our index is actually pointing to something inside the sorted vector because some of the indexes might have already run out, aka we have you know, finished copying all of the elements from that vector. Now, once we're done with this, we actually have the minimum. So now all we need to do is just put the minimum into our output. So we would do output.pushback uh, and we would add our sorted vector current min. So we look at the, at the you know, current minth vector and we grab the index that we're supposed to look at and we add that to our output and then we increment the index um, that we just added we increment it by one uh, essentially moving our pointer forward um, in all of the vectors and this is a perfectly valid implementation here and you can actually see that we you know the running time for this can very intuitively be measured as essentially the first for loop is O of M because we look at all of the different vectors and we have M of those vectors. It's the same for the second for loop calculating the minimum is O of M. So really it comes down to figuring out how many times does our while loop execute because on each execution of the while loop we do O of M work. And that's actually easy to see because if we look at the output the while loop adds one element to the output each time it executes successfully or that completes. And the size of our output is essentially all of our elements. So it's gonna be uh, n times m. So that means the while loop is gonna execute at most n times m, or it's gonna execute exactly n times m times. And each of those times we're gonna do m work as we discussed uh, trying to find the minimum element. So that's where we get the running time being n times m times m. Uh, hopefully that's clear to you because this also points at where you might be able to improve the algorithm so that the running time is a little bit faster than n times m times m. Um, again, I might have the n and the m switched. <laughs> In this example, I don't remember exactly, but that's basically what we're looking at uh, currently. And really the part that you can improve uh, using a priority queue is essentially this for loop where we're trying to find a minimum. Um, the way we would improve this is that we can actually um, create a priority queue. Um, and priority queues help you keep M sorted elements essentially um, and will return the minimum or the maximum depending on how you define a priority queue in constant time. Um, now, the reason this still takes log m time is that every time we remove a minimum element, we will be adding um, a new element to the priority queue and removal and insertion both take log m time. So even though looking up the element is constant, uh, we will always need to remove and add an element and each of those operations actually take uh, log of m time. Well, log of the size of the priority queue and your priority queue is gonna have m minus one elements in it, so log of m. Um, but yeah, that's the only part you need to improve. The rest of the code can basically remain, you know, it's essentially the same idea. Um, and that's how you can get the optimal running time of n times m times log m for merging the sorted lists. There are m several other algorithms that work here. Divide and conquer would work just as well and give you similar running time. You can put the uh, vectors together and then sort them. That'll give you similar running time. Um, so moving on to the last problem in the assignment, we actually have the find anti groups problem. So in this problem, we're given a list of words like act, pack, yam, cat, may, and hello. And essentially what we want to do is we first we want to understand what an anti group is. So the first group we have here consists of act, tack, and cat. And that's because they all three of those words use the letters A, C, T in order to make them sauce. And something that we can notice here is that we, if we sort act, we actually get act. If we sort tack, um, we get 
act, and if we sort cat, we get act. So this is the first thing that you want to notice in this problem as you're solving it, is that there is an efficient way, or a relatively quick way, for you to be able to tell whether two words belong to the same anagroup. Um, the second anagroup is yam and may, so you can see here as well that if you sort these letters, you will also see, you will see uh, Amy, I believe, as the key, and uh, similarly for the last anagroup is hello, and then the point of our algorithm is to essentially return the anagroup that is the largest, so the one that has the most words, in this case the first one. So we can write this pretty simply, we have a vector, find anagroup, sorry, find largest anagroup that's going to take us input another vector of strings, and we're going to return a vector of strings. Obviously the vector of strings that we return might be smaller, but it could be just as large as the original vector of strings that has given us input. So, um, trying to work through this, we would start, um, essentially the optimal solution is O of N running time, uh, I'll say that, and it's really not too complicated. I think really the, the thing that we would look at is to use a hash set. There's also a naive solution where you can imagine that for each word in my input, I find, I iterate over my input again, and I find every word that is an anagroup of that word, and essentially I count, you know, I put that into a vector and see how big that is, right? Um, you could actually do this for every single word, which means that really the running time of this algorithm will be somewhere around O of N squared, um, since for every word you look at every other word to see if it's an anagram, and you keep track of those groups. Now the optimal solution is O of N, um, and you will not get full credit if you implement one that is not O of N. You might get full credit if you find a solution that's O of N log N, um, that is close enough where you might be able to pass the auto grader. Um, but if you do the O of N squared, you will certainly not pass the auto grader. You'll be tested on an input that's about the size of a million, uh, which means O of N squared is just gonna take hours to actually run, whereas an O of N solution will take a few minutes um, at most, or a few seconds actually. So, what you want to do, uh, so let's walk through the optimal solution, because actually it's not that difficult. Um, we want to create a map that maps our keys to our values, and really our keys are going to be this sorted word that we have seen. So act is going to map to act, tack, and cat, uh, let's say. Amy is going to map to yam and may, uh, because Amy is the canonical representation of yam and may. And then hello is going to map to the single vector element containing hello, essentially. Um, although actually, in this case, it wouldn't be the key hello. It would actually be uh, E-H-L-L-W uh, would be the key, because it's sorted. Uh, the canonical version of the key is the one that's sorted. But apologies for that. Anyway, what we would do is we would iterate over each of our words um, from our from our input vector and really the very first thing we want to do is we want to sort the word but in order to sort the word it actually sorts in place so actually what we need to do is we need to create a copy of the word first so we need to find a new string which is the sorted word and we set that equal to our word uh, as we're doing here in line 19 and then we sort that word. Uh, again, standard sort actually does the sorting in place, so it does not return you a new value, it sorts it in place, um, so it tries to be efficient about it. Again, the standard sort um, will really be constant time because we do say that the largest uh, the word can be is 20 characters, so no matter what, it's gonna take, you know, at worst it would be 20 log 20 time which is some constant value, which is, means it's basically constant time. So you don't have to worry about how long it takes to do any manipulation on each, on, on an individual word. It would be a constant time operation because we have words that are at most 20 characters. The words themselves are not a variable here. But anyway, once we have the sorted key, then we look into our hash map to see how many times that key occurs. You can use that using the count function uh, if it occurs zero times, that means that it doesn't exist currently, so our hash map is empty. So what we would want to do is we would want to set the value of that key equal to the single element vector containing our original word. So again, we don't want to use the sorted word, we want to use our original word. Um, 
as we just did here. And in this case, we can imagine that if we're processing the word act, you know, the very first time it's not there, but then we set it into the map. So what does our map look like after the very, very first iteration here is we're going to see that the word act is not a key in the map, but so then we're going to add it. And now we're going to have act pointing to a single element vector containing the word act um, again. Otherwise, if the key already exists in our map, then essentially what we're going to do is we just want to add it to the existing vector. So we just, uh, sorry, not append, we push back onto the existing vector and we push back the word, uh, word. So that, uh, you know, if we're looking at our second word being tac, T-A-C, then that will sort to act, which means the key is going to be act. So that means we're going to bring the single element vector containing act, which means then we're going to push back tack into that vector. So our result is going to be that the key act maps to the vector containing act and tack. Um, so you can imagine that after we finish running this for loop, uh, which actually takes O of n time because we're basically iterating over each of our words and then all the work that we're doing. So looking stuff up in the hash map, counting, time, counting how many times it occurs, pushing elements into a vector. All of this is O of one time. It's all constant. That is the beauty of hash maps is that they have constant lookup uh, and delete operations and insert operations. So that's O of n. And then what we can do is we can iterate over all of the elements in our map at the very end, which again will be in the worst case, it'll be O of n. Uh, but this is, you know, for reference, this is what our map would look like, where we have the keys and then we have the values. And then basically what we would want to do here is we want to find the key, uh, sorry, the vector, the anagroup, because now we have the anagroup. So we just want to find the anagroup that is the largest. So the very first thing we would do actually is we would check to see if we even have any groups to iterate over. Again, if there's no groups, then that means there's no words, which means the default anagroup that's the largest would be the empty anagroup. So we can check that pretty easily by just checking to see if the word size is zero, and then we return it immediately. Otherwise, what we can do is we can assume that the largest anagroup is an empty vector. Um, and I'll do that here in a second because, you know, ev any vector is going to be larger than an empty vector. So we can just uh, start out by assuming that the largest one is an empty one. It's actually what we're about to do here. Um, so we actually don't need to keep track of the size of the max group. Um, you might have thought you needed to do that, but actually you can do dot size on the vector. So you don't need to keep track of the size of the maximum group. You can actually just keep, um, you can just keep track of the vector itself. And now that I'm looking at this video, I actually realized that you wouldn't need the if statement above actually, uh, because the for loop will not execute if groups is empty. Um, so if you return biggest group at the end, you will just return an empty one. But anyway, what we do here is we see to see if the value in our map, if its size is bigger than biggest group, and if it is, we set that equal to the biggest group. And then once we're done, we have found the biggest group, so we simply return the biggest group. And that really is what gives us, um, you know, our solution to this problem, which runs in O of n time. And I fully expect that hopefully this helps you guys out. Again, for the first problem, we did not do an optimal solution. For this problem, the optimal solution is actually pretty straightforward. Um, so hopefully it makes sense to you and you're able to succeed in this homework assignment. See you guys in lecture on Wednesday. Bye.